news and headlines were following at this hour. South Korea will treat COVID-19 in the same way as seasonal flu starting August 31st by downgrading its infectious disease level to the lowest group 4. That means no more daily case tallies and a focusing of resources on high-risk patients. I mean, mounting public concerns over violent crimes targeting random victims, South Korea is to restructure its police to put crime prevention as top priority while possibly bringing back auxiliary police. Following Japan's decision to start releasing Fukushima waste water on Thursday, the UN nuclear watchdog will be stationed on site to provide real-time safety updates. Good afternoon. South Korea is now even closer to the complete endemic phase of COVID-19. It has lowered its infectious disease level to the lowest group 4, treating it in the same way as seasonal flu. And starting August 31st, this will mean no more daily case tallies and resources being focused on high-risk patients. Our Che Soo Hyung tells us more. Starting from August 31st, the South Korean government will lower COVID-19's infectious disease level from Group 2 to Group 4. The Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency said on Wednesday that this decision was made due to a decrease in the spread of COVID-19 since the end of June, a reduction in virus risk, overall stable epidemic prevention conditions and sufficient capacity within the general health care system. Furthermore, the agency stated that although one or two major and minor COVID-19 outbreaks are expected each year, most countries worldwide have already been managing COVID-19 within their general medical systems. The decision means the focus now will shift from counting daily case numbers to protecting high-risk groups. The downgrade from Group 2 to Group 4 means there will be no more daily reporting of confirmed case numbers which had been going on for three years and seven months. Also, under Group 4, people no longer need to report COVID-19 infections within 24 hours, nor do they need to isolate. Instead, the government plans to operate a more precise monitoring system to observe the COVID-19 trend on a weekly basis. However, the officials said that even with the transition to Group 4, there are still ongoing concerns about new COVID-19 variants. The KDCA said that masks will still be required for the time being at infection-vulnerable facilities such as hospitals and nursing homes. Additionally, support for COVID-19 diagnosis and treatment costs, operation of screening clicks and the supply of vaccines and treatments will still be provided free of charge for now. The government stated that it will manage the epidemic situation in a stable manner going forward. Choi Soo Hyung, Arirang News. Amid mounting public concern over violent crimes targeting random victims, South Korea is set to restructure its police force to put crime prevention as its top priority. It also pushed for tougher laws against perpetrators or providing more support for victims. Our Kim do has the details. Following a series of shocking crimes in South Korea, the nation is reorganizing the police force while bringing back auxiliary police. Prime Minister Han Dok Su and law enforcement related ministers addressed the nation on Wednesday morning to lay out major plans for public safety. We will prioritize law enforcement as a top police duty and reorganize police structures to strengthen capacity. To significantly enhance crime prevention capabilities, we will actively consider the reintroduction of auxiliary policemen. The auxiliary police was once a mandatory military service option for South Korean men. However, it began downsizing in 2017 and currently has no members. South Korea's chief of police said the plan as of now is to have up to 8,000 auxiliary policemen, which would take around seven to nine months, and explained this is to have more officers available around the clock. The prime minister also reiterated pushing for life sentences without the possibility of parole for such crimes, while establishing regulations to penalize public threats and possession of weapons in public places. In terms of perpetrators with mental health issues, related policies are being re-evaluated, including prevention, early detection, 
treatment and daily recovery processes with the ability of courts to admit people into mental hospitals strengthened. The government is also looking to take care of victims better. One-stop solution centers will be established to provide various forms of support, including legal, economic, psychological, employment, and welfare aid for the victims. Aiding the victims is very important, and the budget is to be prioritized. Considering our nation spends billions hosting international events, we need to inject plenty of funds to support this. Lastly, the government is encouraging people to provide more tips to police regarding threats to safety while it pledged to work more with related volunteers. The Prime Minister also pointed out some fundamental reasons for the recent rise in these serious crimes. Several factors contribute to these heinous crimes, including social marginalization and the proliferation of relative alienation due to the rise of social media. While this does not justify the crimes, he says the government is analyzing the reasons with experts to come up with measures to fundamentally fix the root of the problem. Kim Doya, Arirang News. As part of the ongoing urge civil defense exercise for the first time in six years, there will be a nationwide air raid evacuation drill. At 2 p.m. later this afternoon, an air raid warning siren will sound. Then for the next 15 minutes, residents must evacuate to a nearby shelter and listen to radio broadcasts. Drivers on designated sections must pull over to the right side of the road. Then the guard alarm will be issued at 2.15 and you can resume moving while maintaining your guard. You can return to normal after the guard alarm is lifted at 2.20. You can find designated shelters on the National Disaster and Safety Portal or on the Emergency Ready app. If there's no shelters nearby, head to a building basement. Following Japan's announcement to start releasing wastewater from the destroyed Fukushima nuclear power plant on Thursday, the South Korean government says it sees the plant as having no scientific or technical issues while vying to make sure Korea's public safety is guaranteed. Choi Min-jung reports. With Japan set to proceed with the release of Fukushima wastewater as soon as Thursday, the South Korean government has determined that there are no scientific or technical problems with the planned discharge. Speaking at a briefing on Tuesday afternoon, the first deputy chief of the Office for Government Policy Coordination, Park gu stressed that this, however, does not mean that the government accepts or supports the wastewater release. Our government concluded today that we'll ask Japan to immediately stop the discharge if the actual process goes differently from what was planned, as it would threaten the safety and health of our people. In order to enhance the transparency and reliability of the disposal, Park said South Korea has consulted with the IAEA and Japan about having Korean experts participate in the on-site inspection operated by the IAEA. The Korean government also asked Japan to immediately stop the release and notify the government if something unusual occurs. Lastly, South Korea has requested the sharing of real-time information for prompter, transparent monitoring. In response, Japan, in coordination with the IAEA, agreed to post relevant data online every hour with the information provided in Korean as well. To ease concerns, the government announced its future plans aimed at protecting the safety and health of people in Korea. As we have done so far, our government will focus on the health and safety of the people and respond transparently and promptly, while doing our best to minimize damage to fishers and the fisheries industry. First, the government plans to significantly expand the scope of monitoring to include the waters near the Pacific Islands and the Northwest Pacific near Japan. Authorities also vowed to expand simulations using actual data obtained after the release to reflect what's really going on. The government has been judging that the impact of the release on domestic waters and marine products will not be significant. This comes as results from various simulations have shown that radioactive substances from the wastewater would flow into Korean waters several years later in a considerably diluted state. Choi Min-jung, Arirang News. 
And for the thorough monitoring of the release, the International Atomic Energy Agency will remain stationed at Fukushima plant, providing real-time updates to the international community and with South Korea through a separate channel. Shin ha has the details. The International Atomic Energy Agency will review the situation during and after the discharge of Fukushima wastewater. Following the announcement by the Japanese government on Tuesday, the IAEA published a statement on its website saying that its staff on site will continue to monitor and assess the activities to ensure their ongoing alignment with safety standards, including on the day of the discharge starting and after. The agency has staff stationed in a Fukushima office that was opened last month, where South Korea will also send its experts. The IAEA experts there will directly observe the process of collecting wastewater samples. While regularly visiting related facilities, they will coordinate discussions between the IAEA and Tokyo Electric Power Company if any changes occur. It also plans to publish data for the use of the global community, including real-time monitoring information. An additional update will be provided as soon as the discharge begins. Unlike the United States, which has been supportive of the discharge, China has criticized Japan's latest decision. China strongly urges Japan to rectify its wrongful decision and withdraw its plan to discharge nuclear contaminated water into the sea. A Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson added that Beijing will take necessary measures to safeguard food safety and the health of its people. Hong Kong Chief Executive John Lee on Tuesday said he strongly opposes the decision, saying the city would immediately activate import controls on Japanese seafood. On the other hand, the European Union last month decided to remove its import restrictions on Japanese food that had been in place since the nuclear accident in 2011. Meanwhile, the environmental organization Greenpeace has criticized Japan's latest decision, arguing that it violates human rights in both Japan and the Pacific region and that it ignores the concerns of people, including fishermen. Shin Na-yong, Arirang News. South Korea's budget plan for 2024 will focus on supporting the socially underprivileged or normalizing finances by making necessary improvements. That is according to Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Chu kyung ho at a budget meeting between the government and the ruling People Power Party on Wednesday. The plan includes increasing financial support for parents with newborns and infants. Full tuition will be given to students from low-income families. There will also be new one-on-one -on -one care services for disabled people with developmental disorders. For small business owners, low-interest loans will be expanded, and there will be financial support for their energy bills and insurance coverage. The outlook for the manufacturing sector in August has worsened due to a slower than expected recovery in the semiconductor industry. According to the Bank of Korea's Business Survey Index on Wednesday, business sentiment among manufacturing firms fell five points from July to 67, the lowest since February. The figure for non-manufacturing businesses was also down, dropping a single point to 75, decreasing for a third consecutive month. The BSI for all industries dropped three points to 71, falling for the third month in a row. The BSI measures business sentiment with a number below 100, meaning pessimist and number optimist. The United States has made clear it does not want the Chinese economy to tumble, calling on Beijing to be more transparent about the state of its economy. Washington also removed some Chinese entities from its export control unverified list. Lee sing with more. Last week, the Chinese government stopped the publication of a report on soaring youth unemployment amid concerns the statistics would reveal new weaknesses in the country's recovery. China also cracked down on corporate due diligence firms operating in the country, halting the flow of information to overseas businesses. In response, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan on Tuesday called on Beijing to be more transparent about the state of its economy. Speaking to reporters in Washington, Sullivan said that for global confidence, predictability, 
and the capacity of the rest of the world to make sound economic decisions, it's important for China to maintain a level of transparency in the publication of its data. His comments also come as U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo is set to travel to China at the end of this month for talks with high-level Chinese officials in what seems to be a move by Washington to stabilize relations with Beijing. Raimundo's trip follows a four-day visit by Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen last month, who held more than 10 hours of meetings with senior officials in Beijing. Meanwhile, in a bid to further normalize bilateral trade with China, the U.S. Department of Commerce announced Tuesday local time that it has removed 27 Chinese entities from its export control unverified list. The Chinese Commerce Ministry welcomed the decision, saying that the move is in line with the common interests of the two sides. The ministry added that solutions that would be beneficial to both countries can be found as long as the two sides follow the principle of frank cooperation and mutual benefit. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. On the second day of the BRICS summit in South Africa, talks on the group's possible expansion are expected. Wednesday's achievements will likely be shared in what is called the Egoli Declaration, our Ishihu reports. The BRICS group of major emerging economies on the second day of its 15th leader summit on Wednesday is expected to discuss major issues, including the expansion of the group and economic cooperation. The presidents of China, Xi Jinping and Brazil, Luis Inacio Lula da Silva, as well as the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, and the Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, representing President Vladimir Putin, are being hosted by South African President Cyril Ramaphosa in Johannesburg. At the closed and open meeting scheduled for Wednesday, the leaders are expected to continue discussing whether to add new members to the group that's aiming to become a geopolitical alternative to Western-led forums. Twenty-three countries have formally applied to join, including Saudi Arabia, Argentina, Indonesia and Egypt. China, South Africa and Russia are open to accepting new members. South Africa and China have similar views with regard to the expansion of BRICS membership and we look forward to the discussions that we are going to have with other BRICS leaders later today during our retreat. We need to strengthen strategic cooperation, practice true multilateralism, promote the expansion of the representation and voice of countries in the global south in the global governance process. India, wary of China's dominance, has warned against Russian expansion but is undecided. Brazil is reportedly concerned that potential expansion will dilute its influence, although it's shown support for its neighbor, Argentina's application to join. The leaders are also expected to discuss trade and investment opportunities, energy cooperation and infrastructure development. Also on the agenda are ways to strengthen mutualistic partnerships between developing countries in Africa and the Global South, reforms to global governance and fostering a global environment for peace. Based on the results of the discussion, an announcement on the so-called Eagley Declaration is expected. Named after the Zulu term for Johannesburg, the declaration will cover cooperation achievements in the areas of politics and the economy. The three-day summit runs until Thursday. Isihu, Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. In northwestern Pakistan, eight people, including six children, were safely pulled from a cable car in a dramatic rescue. The 12-hour ordeal on Tuesday near the city of Batagram saw one child airlifted by helicopter, while the rest were moved to safety by a zip line. Pakistan's army said that rescue efforts were made dangerous and difficult because of windy conditions. The children had been on their way to school when one of the cable car's cables snapped almost 300 meters above a ravine. The cable car is used to cut travel time through a valley from two hours to just four minutes. In Greece's northeast, firefighters fighting a wildfire have discovered the remains of 18 burnt bodies. According to the local fire brigade on Tuesday, the bodies were found by a shack in a remote village near the port city of Alexandropolis. They are believed to have been migrants who crossed in from Turkey. 
The Greek border region is a known crossing point for thousands of migrants looking to enter Europe. The discovery comes as a number of wildfires rage in Europe, including in neighboring Turkey, where six villages have been evacuated and water traffic was temporarily suspended on the Dardanelles Strait. It also comes amid scorching heat waves in southern Europe that have triggered several red alerts in Italy and France. Now, after months of political suspense and legal maneuvers, Thailand has elected Sreta Tavazin of the Poi Thai Party as its new prime minister. The real estate mogul was elected in a successful parliamentary vote on Tuesday, supported by a coalition that includes pro-military parties linked to a 2014 coup that installed military-backed rule. An election back in May saw the progressive Move Forward Party win the most votes, but they were blocked from power by conservative senators. Tavazin's election came hours after former PM and fugitive Thakshin Shinawat returned to the country after 15 years of self-imposed exile. He was immediately arrested and charged with abuse of power and other criminal offenses, which he says are politically motivated. Shinawat is known as a figurehead for the Poitai party. And finally, a rare spotless giraffe has been born at a private zoo in the U.S. state of Tennessee. It's currently the only one of its kind in the world that we know of. Only one other spotless giraffe born in a Tokyo Zoo in 1972 has ever been recorded in history. A giraffe's spots serve as a form of camouflage and aid in thermal regulation. The zoo is now looking to give her a name and has opened an online vote on its Facebook page. People can choose between four names, Kapiki, Feriali, Shakiri or Jamila. Voting closes on September 4th. Matthew Ashley, Arirang News. Good afternoon. It's Chaozo today, the second autumn seasonal term. Summer heat should subside from now on. Today's rain might help to cool things down a bit for western parts of the country. Heavy rain that started on Jeju Island this morning has been expanded to more western regions. And the capital area in Gangwon-do province could see more than 150 millimeters of downpours. And the rest of the country could see 50 to 120 millimeters to Thursday. Now, a heavy rain advisor has been issued for some of the northern central areas, including here in Seoul and town on Jeollado provinces. Meanwhile, eastern areas will have a scorcher under sunny skies with some passing rain in the afternoon. The east will see rain mainly tomorrow. Seoul and Chuchon are seeing highs in the mid-20s this afternoon, but Gyeongju at 34 degrees Celsius. On and off, rain continues into Friday, then more showers are expected early next week, bringing much bearable temperatures to the country. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. A knife rampage at a subway station, a stabbing spree attacking shoppers and pedestrians, beating and raping a woman on hiking trail. Lately, South Korea has been grappling with these mujima or don't ask why crimes targeting random victims. The BBC described them as inexplicable acts of violence driven by no person linked to victims or obvious motive. It notes the fact that they're happening in a country where the homicide rate is half the OECD average. 
but those Mujima acts are more common, with three cases having been reported daily so far this year. And hundreds of copycat threats are spreading online. With crime prevention now the police's top priority in what used to be considered a safe country. That is all for today. Thanks for watching.